Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Fee, Senior Curator of Global Fashion and Textiles at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. I am also the lead curator of the ROM original exhibition, Cloth That Changed the World, India's Painted and Printed Cottons, which is on display until September 2021. I'm delighted you could join us today for Curator Conversations, a digital program that explores themes and subjects from ROM collections alongside industry professionals. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabe Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. It is my very great pleasure to have with us live today from Bangalore, India, Vanuka Reddy, direct from her Red Tree Textiles studio. And as she will explain today, she is a chintz artist. She uses the column pen and natural dye plants to make exquisite artworks. Now, now Renuka contributed in many ways to our exhibition, Cloth That Changed the World. She produced two very different contemporary pieces, um, including a process set that helps visitors to understand the intricacies of making chintz. And she also made a full-size piece based on a collection, a historic piece that's in the wrong collection, which I can show you uh, this way, uh, which is on display in the Central Corelli Court. Renuka also participated in the making of our catalog, Cloth That Changed the World, The Art in Fashion of Indian Chintz, contributing a chapter on the importance of the cotton textile itself to the artworks. Now, Renuka and I first met at her studio in Bangalore in 2018, where we started many conversations. I have to give her a special thank you because we miscalculated the time a bit, thinking it was 1.30 in the morning for her. It's actually 2.30 in the morning for her. So we are grateful to you, Renuka, for joining us virtually. The next best thing to having you with us. So uh, I just, just a word that if you have questions for Renuka, please put them into the Q&A uh, section of your screen at the bottom. So I think it's important to begin, um, Renuka, by helping uh, our viewers to understand what chintz is and what makes it unique, um, the main steps in making it. Uh, some people are going to think that chintz is a type of design, but I believe you see it as a set of very specific techniques. So if we could start there, please. Um, sure. But first, thanks for having me, Sarah. I'm, I'm delighted to be here um, to talk about my work. And to uh, before I answer that question, I'm just going to share my screen here. So I have some images to help that. Um, so the generally accepted historic definition um, of chins is that it comes from a Hindi word, um, cheat, meaning um, spotted, sprayed, um, <clears throat> or speckled, and English-speaking traders pluralized the word to chins and, and the kind of became chins. So um, while chins was used to refer to both painted and printed cottons, I work primarily with painted techniques used historically. So to me, chins is hand-drawn, modern painted, and resist dyed cotton. And I'd, I'd like to go a little bit into um, detail into that. So when I say hand drawn, um, so the left um, side picture is one of the first processes where it begins with a cloth treated with buffalo milk and myrobalan, which gives that yellowish color. So the outlines are first hand drawn using a column, which is a bamboo pen. And this pen is dipped in a solution of fermented iron for black and alum, uh, which is a modern for red. Then it is dyed in a, in a madder family dye, which is the center picture. And then it is bleached using dung and sunlight, which is the right picture. And once this process is done, the next, in the next process, we have outlines. Um, now that the outlines in black and red are done, then fine lines and then large areas are painted in wax. And then the whole cloth is dipped in an indigo vat um, to get the blues. So here is resist dyeing, which I mentioned as part of the definition. And 
in the next um, stage, um, clots is again treated with buffalo milk and myrobalan. And then lines, fine lines are drawn in wax. And then on top of the wax lines, various combinations and concentrations of mordants are painted. And then the fabric is dyed again, which is a center picture. So here is mordant painted. So when the cloth is dyed in madder, many different um, you know, colors develop in one part, which is, which is uh, to me, it's one of my favorite steps in the process. And then finally, it is bleached again using down in sunlight, which is the right uh, picture. And then finally, yellow dye is painted uh, for yellows and then, or it is over painted on blues uh, for green. So in fact, this is the only step where the dye is already mixed with the mordant um, is painted and, and rarely um, dyed. So when one says painted cottons, you know, it sounds like dyes are painted directly onto the cloth when in fact, most of the colors are got from dyeing and not painting. And, you know, um, I see chins as a, not as a design, but rather as a, a, as a set of specific techniques um, because it was the same techniques that we used to make, you know, floral patterns, which went to the West, like the one, uh, one in the picture on the left, um, as well as figural designs or geometric designs, which are so popular in Southeast Asia. And it is precisely the techniques that, you know, made such design diversity possible and also gave properties to the cloth, such as, you know, great color fastness, um, wide palette of colors, um, and these are the properties that made gin so popular. And this, and this is especially considering that cotton was used, which is um, generally a difficult fabric to dye. So it's a, it's a long, complicated um, process with many steps. Thank you so much for that. I think it did really help everyone to see that it is long, complicated, um, and a very intricate art. So. Um, most of the other contemporary artists that we're featuring in our exhibition come came out of family traditions, but I understand that you did not, that you really started from square zero yourself. So I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about your background, you know, some of your early work or studies. I think you've had several chapters to your life. That's right. Um, so I did my undergrad in clothing and textiles, and, and then I got a graduate diploma in leather design and technology. I know it's quite a different uh, uh, um, different kind of subject, but from India. And then I went on to work with hand loops and handicrafts in India for some time. Um, then I went on to pursue a graduate degree in apparel, textiles, and merchandising from Eastern Michigan University, but, but really the program was geared towards servicing the auto industry. And after that, I went on to work for a company um, which made automotive interiors for the OEMs like um, you know, General Motors or Chrysler. And my, one of my primary responsibilities was to ensure that you know, the selection of cover materials, you know, like textiles or leather, PVC, basically that went into making of the seats. Um, I had to ensure that the selection facilitated the quality requirements of um, fit, form, and function of the seats. Um, basically what that meant was understanding and assessing properties of materials. So it involved a lot of experimenting, testing, um, analyzing results. So while my experience in India was largely with craft-based products, um, my experience in the US was primarily working with technical textiles. And, and after that, I started working with chins. Uh, okay, there's a bit of a jump there. I, I see. How do you go from a motor city, from Detroit industrial textiles to back to India and really handcrafted intricate um, art? So how did well, you come to Chintz, I guess, as the medium amongst all the others? I, I guess it was a, a bit of a coincidence and a lucky coincidence at that because I was planning a move back to India and, and it was, I happened to get my hands on a VNA publication called um, Chintz Indian Textiles for the West written by Rosemary Krill. And I, I still recall, you know, my reaction to the images in that book. Uh, they were just so full of life and, and magical. And, and I decided I just wanted to make them when I moved back to India. 
Um, I had planned on working with artisans in India to make those, you know, historic designs, but I really couldn't find anyone who knew how to make those, um, the historic quality. So I started reading and researching about these textiles. And the more I learned about, um, you know, um, and researching about how they were made, I, I really was got more fascinated with how they were made rather than it was the visuals that got me started working with chins, but it was really the process that made me um, fall in love with it. And, and, and I must say, I mean, coming from the auto industry background, it is truly one of the most efficient processes I have ever seen. Um, and, and also having worked with um, crafts and technical textiles, I felt this was a great medium for me to explore because you know chins yes it involves a lot of uh, working with hands but it is also a lot, a lot about material science and and so trying to figure out how chins was made historically was was really super interesting and and challenging at the same time um yeah this it, your story still amazes me uh one thing i did forget to point out in the introduction um that one of uh, renuka's uh main aims is to revive some techniques that have been lost because of our historic pieces that we have on display, our 18th century pieces, some um, uh, techniques uh, were discontinued. Uh, and so that has been in some ways um, at the heart of her um, project. So um, just to kind of go back a few steps, how did you set about this? How, what did you do in your first five years, let's say, because you've been at this now for 10 years, correct? Yes. Um, I think the first three years was, was just spent mostly in research. Um, I traveled a lot, visiting various museums to see their chins collection. I must have poured over thousands of images. Um, there is unfortunately not a lot of literature out there on the process, but, but there are some very good ones available. For example, um, there are two wonderfully detailed accounts written by two Frenchmen in the 18th century um, that are quite specific. And, and yet, you know, sometimes it felt like it was written in some, some kind of code because there was just so much information. But at the same time, you know, not enough to just pick up a column and start painting. Um, you know, what I mean is that broadly speaking, it, it takes about 30 steps to finish a piece of chins. And um, and I had to understand, well, I'm still trying to understand each step and, and how the materials used in, in every step interact with each other. So um, I think my first almost five years was just, just experiments. I don't think I did actually make any piece in the first five years. Um, one of my first experiments is, uh, and I'm going to share my screen here again. Um, yeah, so this is this is from one of those experiments, and this was done to you know basically study how variables such as yarn count um, weave moderns, different concentrations and source of moderns, um, water quality, you know, tap water or filter water. So how do all these variables influence the dyed colors? So my uh, I think first five years was just research, study, and experiments um, were largely based on these lines. Now, I've got to say, seeing all those color experiments in your studio really opened my eyes um, to this idea of the importance of the cotton fabric, which we tend to forget about. Um, we think about the color, the design, and we forget about that cotton. That's why your contribution to the catalog was so important in, in drawing our eyes away from the color and design to actually something that also makes it unique, which is the cotton um, base. So. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what were some of the biggest challenges or major milestones with all this experimentation. Were there aha moments or um, some big uh, methodological milestones? Um, oh, definitely. I think right away it was it was um, quite clear that there were three um, main challenges if if I wanted to get into this. Um, so one of the first ones was the wax stresses. So in this picture, you know, the little white lines that you see are made by painting wax and then um, painting moderns over it and then dyeing it. Um, to me, 
you know, you, there is chins that exist without um, back stress as, as, as also the details. Um, but to me, the, the fine white lines, um, I think it's such a quintessential character of chins to me that it's really one of the first um, things I wanted to explore. Um, so the question was, you know, how does one draw such fine lines and wax and, and what is a wax content that allows the wax to have, you know, such a low melting temperature that I can actually use it and, and paint very tiny details, but also have great resisting property at the same time. Um, I have not come across fine um, wax painting in India today. So um, I went to Indonesia to study there Batik practices um, and to study the kind of, um, you know, wax materials that they use. Um, so I am able to achieve fairly um, fine wax lines today, but, but I continue to investigate and improve the resist. Um, the second challenge was, you know, how can I dye cotton in various shades of pinks, reds, purples, browns using natural dyes? and then expose it to sunlight for days and sometimes weeks, which I have to, um, because you know when the cloth is dyed, which is the cloth on the left, uh, the background takes on the color as well. Um, and so I have to bleach um, the cloth to remove this unwanted color. And that basically means soaking in dung and exposing it to sunlight. So the question was, how do I expose it to sunlight um, for such an extended period of time and still retain bright colors? So this part of it really involves studying dyes and moderns um, and understand what kind of combinations work. And the third challenge, which um, is keeping me occupied a lot these days, is how to dye a waxed cloth in an indigo vat um, without cracks. You know, I was, I was obsessed with uh, fine wax lines for so long that it, it really came as a surprise to me how difficult it was to apply uh, wax on large areas without it cracking and, and also have a good resisting property at the same time, um, especially in, a, in an extremely alkaline indigo wax. So, you know, wax such as beeswax, are, it is not very um, resistant to alkaline mediums. Um, and fortunately, historic accounts give very little information about, you know, the materials that was um, used for resist. Um, so I have been experimenting with various uh, materials and I have been able to, I have been able to dye cotton in indigo with fairly good results. But um, again, this is um, the work in progress. So I don't know if you can see um, the cloth onto my left is, has been dyed um, in indigo. I think it's been dipped about eight times and with a 10 minute dip um, in each and the cloth behind me, um, it's been dyed as well, but the wax is not removed yet. So you can see how the cloth, the, uh, the wax still has that blue sheen on it. Um, so yes, these were the three main challenges. And at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm quite focused on the indigo dyeing. So if I understand correctly, the, the fine painting with wax had basically disappeared and you've had to um, reinvent it yourself. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, that you've had, that the, the recipes and the techniques for the wax resist for painting with wax, not printing, but painting had disappeared and you've had to reinvent it yourself. Yes, um, I, to my knowledge, there's no printing happening as well um, in the traditional um, regions of India, like Machli Patna Mokal has the, um, to my knowledge, there's no resist applied either wax or clay. I mean, it is done in some parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat where uh, printing is done, but but not in the hand painted chins. No, it's, just, it, it's extraordinary. And if people have the opportunity to see the enormous historic pieces that we have that are, you know, 12 feet tall and, you know, eight feet wide, that would have been uh, treated in this way and put in dive house. It's, it's extraordinary. It, you've really helped us to uh, appreciate the, the magic, the art, the science of these pieces. So I would consider wax then, you know, what we might call an unsung hero, and we've talked about these before. Um, the, the ingredients, you know, so many studies focus on the plant dyes, which are the, the obvious ones um, and the design, 
but you know, you focused on the wax. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the other ingredients that maybe don't get the, the, the applause that they deserve, such as the, the buffalo milk, the dung, the sunshine, mm -hmm. what roles those play in, in your work in the process? And are the modern versions good? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, when it comes to milk, it's, it's the high fat content in buffalo milk, um, which allows moderns to be drawn on the cloth without spreading. And, and really that is a very beginning of chins, you know, to be able to draw. And so it is a very important ingredient in the process. And then today we also understand that the calcium in the milk is, um, is crucial for matadine. I have tried, you know, um, cow milk, but it, I haven't really had great results. Um, so I'm, I, I, do, do, I do quite try and find out buffalo milk, which sometimes is difficult in Bangalore, but I have been called a buffalo stalker. So, um, and then coming to dung and sunshine, again, the start of the process um, also, and ends with bleaching cloth with dung and sunshine, um, as well as several times during the process. Um, unfortunately, I have not been able to find a replacement for either of these, which actually would be great and make my life easier, you know, so I can work on cloudy days, but, but really dung and sunshine are to me magical um, because not only does um, these two um, help in remo removing non-modern colors, but also in removing buffalo milk, you know, you can try washing a cloth that's been treated with buffalo milk many, many times. But believe me, that smell of stale milk just never goes away. And, and I've realized that the only way to get rid of milk is to, you know, soak it in um, dung at night and then expose it to sunshine multiple times. And in my experience, it's been the same with wax, interestingly. I mean, no matter how many times I have tried to boil the cloth to remove the, uh, the wax, it's never worked. Um, I, have, I have to soak it in dung and expose it to sunshine because the next step is really important that the cloth has this great observing quality. So all the wax has to be removed. So, so yeah, absolutely unsung heroes <laughs> of the process. Um, yeah all this empirical experimentation has done so much, I think, to further our understanding of how these ingredients work together that, uh, yeah, it, it did not get recorded in these 18th century um, European accounts always. Um, and what kind of dung do you use? And do you recommend any specific type? Well, I have tried um, cow dung, sheep dung, and goat dung, and I have kind of settled comfortably settle with sheep dung because cow dung is just it's just too wet <laughs> for me to um to be comfortable you know using it with my hands and and goat dung is really hard um it takes a very long time for it to get soft so sheep dung is a nice combination of those two and i have a lot of sheep around where i live so <laughs> <laughs> or sheep stalker too um so, you know, talking about these unsung in heroes and ingredients that haven't really been recorded, um, I'm wondering what your experience has taught you about the Indian chintz artists who worked in the 18th century. Um, you know, we, we know probably the least about them. We do have these European uh, accounts of some of the techniques, some of the ingredients, but not so much about who the artists were, who made these, uh, where they were from, who they were. Um, so, have you been able, I don't know, to get in their head, so to speak? Oh gosh, I, I have tried. <laughs> you know, in, in the last 10 years, um, you know, I've so often found myself thinking, you know, how did they do it? You know, what were they thinking? And sometimes when I'm particularly frustrated with something, I've even thought, oh, they must have been crazy to even try and do that. You know, so to I think to discover and, and sustain this practice for hundreds of years, um, I can only imagine that 18th century artisans must have been exceptionally creative um, and curious in their surroundings. And, and I think they must have been extremely patient as well. Um, and they were able to work in teams because a lot of the process were done by a different group of artisans. You know, someone did the outlines and while another did the dyeing, someone else did the wax resins, someone else did the bleaching, but, but the results came together so beautifully and, and that was um, you know, spectacular. So it really says something about the absence. 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, amazed too about uh, uh, also their powers of observation um, in of the natural world around them. So this leads me, I guess, to another question that's related. And this is a question I often get when I'm showing our historic pieces. Uh, people ask me, how long did that take to make? And if there were teams of people working on these and specialized artisans where you are a, uh, a one woman band doing it all, um, can I ask you how long does it take you to make uh, a long, a large full size piece? Um, so the ROM piece took me about nine months to finish, um, but um, sometimes size is not an indication. Um, for example, even if you were, if I were to do um, say a six inch by a six inch piece, it would still take two to three months because even though the time um, taken to draw and paint um, would be less because of the size, but the multiple cycles of bleaching the cloth takes the same amount of time regardless of the size. So to, to give you an idea, um, there are a minimum of five to set, uh, five rounds of bleaching in the process. And if each is about five to seven days, and, and it depends really on the time of the year, that's already a month um, that just goes in bleaching. So yes, it's a, it's a long process. Whoa, so you, you can't hurry nature. It, um... <laughs> that, that's part of the beauty of it. Um, so just uh, moving back a few years, you had your first solo exhibition in New Delhi in 2017, as I understand it. You know, how did it feel after all those years of basically, you say the first five years, not completing a piece, really working alone in your studio? How, how did that feel? Um, well, I guess I can explain it this way. You know, I had some young visitors to my studio a couple of years ago and and when I talked about what I do and and why I do it and you know showed some of my work um one of them pointed out um to the textiles and and she said oh they're like your babies and and you know I, I thought about it for a while and and I realized that you know I'm only attached to to the piece as I'm making it um, and learning from the experience, it's it's. Um, but when it is finished, um, I don't really feel like it's mine, or or in any way like deeply associated with it. So when I actually had um, um, the show in 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 um, New Delhi, um, in this beautiful gallery called Art Motive, uh, which is run by the fabulous Mala Aleja, it, it really felt surreal because. You know, I, I really couldn't see the whole pieces. What I would, what I could see were all those little steps and the big steps um, it took to get there, and and really to appreciate the historic craft and craftsmen. So yeah, I think uh, I think my focus on the show was really, um, I think it made me only appreciate the craft more, really. Well, congratulations! It, it's extraordinary. I, I wish I could have seen it but we are lucky to have two of your pieces um, on display at the ROM. So um, yours has been kind of an individual journey, but I'm wondering if looking down the line, you know, let's say 20 years down the line, uh, what do you see for the future of, of Chint's, you know, hand-painted column, mm -hmm. um, cottons in India and, and natural dyes? Um, well, I think in a larger sense, um, whatever natural dye practices that exist today in the manufacture of chins, I'm afraid I think they will continue to disappear um, because of the widespread use of chemical dyes. And I'm, and I'm not talking only about synthetic alizarin, but, but I'm seeing a lot of pigments being used. Um, so there's very little or almost no dyeing at all. It's just painting with chemical dyes on top of the, uh, on top of the club. Um, in a way, that's fine too because you know it's it's it serves a particular market. Um, but because these products are sold as natural dyes, um, natural dye products at very low prices, I feel that there's no real incentive for for artisans, you know, to continue natural dye practices, which are challenging. Um, but the good news is that I think in other craft sectors, you know, there are individuals and organizations such as 
Um, I know you've met Jagada Raj, and you probably met most of these uh, people like Jagada Rajappa or Hichika Srinivas from Pedana or Sutra Textiles, Marco Textiles, um, artist Ajit Kumar Das. You know, all these people are passionate about the use of um, natural dyes. And I, so I think that this exciting world of natural dyes will continue to flourish in India in some way. Maybe not in a large um, sector, but it, it will continue to be practiced. Well, that, that's very encouraging. That's hopeful. Um, oh, glad to hear that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then it looks like we have a lot of questions, um, and we want to have time for that. So. Um, I wanted to ask what it was like, and I know you've, you've written other for other um, publications on the process of chintz, um, and you wrote for our catalog, and you're writing for a second publication uh, that my colleague Alexander Palmer will be publishing later this year on the ROMS collection of uh, Indo-European um, chintz men's gowns or banyans, so you've contributed to that as well. So what's it like to write? about what is very a very tactile uh, process. Uh, is, is it frustrating to try to put words to it? Um, it's always easier to demonstrate than to describe. So what, what's it been like writing about gents in the process? Um, I think one challenge has been just because it's so complex, how, how do you, you know, how does one simplify it? for it to you know, come across to the reader. Um, and I've been on the other side trying to you know, decode the, the 18th century texts and, and sometimes they can just go right over your head. Um, so dif the difficulty has been to simplify it, but um, the challenge also is because there's, there's not, it's not like one step is doing only one thing um, or one material is doing only one thing. Um, for example, Maribalan is there as a pre-modern, but it's also there um, as, as a combination to get black. So almost every material and process has these multiple roles. So to tie all those together is, I think, is really difficult to, to do that. Um, but yeah, but writing it always clarifies something for me. So it's a great experience. Well, I hope that someday down the line, um, when you manage to get a free few years that you'll write up all of these experiences. Uh, you're so generous with your knowledge with all of us. I'm so grateful for that. Um, all of this work and care and then your generosity. So thank you again um, for sharing with us today. Were there any other images that you had wanted to um, show us or I'll just switch to... Uh, well, I wanted to show, um, you know, a sunny day um, what it looks like <laughs> when, when I'm exposing the cloth to, um, to the sunlight. So yeah, there it is. And, and that too on your, on your rooftop, on your deck? Yes, that's on and my that, so That's bleaching. That is the step of bleaching. Yes. So underwater and in the strong sun. That's, that's right. Well, thank you for sharing some flowers and greenery too, as we got in here in Toronto, whatever our um, five centimeters of snow last night. So I'm going to look at um, some of the, our question and answers. Now, a first question that we had earlier that I'll put to you um, now is we had a question of someone asking if um, COVID has um, in any way affected your work or what they were asking about the supply chain? Um, it hasn't affected my work so much, but I imagine the, you know, the other craft production centers would have been definitely um, affected by COVID uh, because most of my materials come, come around um, close to me and, and I use really a small amount of dyes, for example, but, you know, things like milk and dung and, you know, they're readily accessible to me. So in that sense, it's been great. So this, and so here's a question that kind of ties into it. This is the question is, how many people do you employ in your workshop? Oh, it's just me. Um, I have one woman who comes to help me um, with some washing, but yes, it's, it's just me. Uh, let's see. 
what red matter dye do you use? Um, so I use a combination of um, Rubia tinctorum and Rubia cartifolia. Um, uh, I mean, the, the dye that was used was is, is shea, which is no longer cultivated. So um, unfortunately, we don't have access to that. So nobody, to your knowledge, is using the shea today? Yes. Okay, here's a question. Does the dung not stain the cloth? Oh gosh, I wish I could show you an image of that. Yes, it does actually. So I, when I soak the cloth in dung at night and I take it out and it's washed, it's actually yellow and, and sometimes really funny colors depending on what the sheep ate. Um, but it's magical. You put it out in the sun and within an hour it's gone. And it's just, you know, the yellowness is gone and the cloth begins to slowly lose the, you know, the background color. So yeah, it stains, but I, I don't know why exactly, but it, it goes away very quickly. Okay, we've got lots of questions, so I'm trying to scroll through them. Um, well, we have, we have opened the, the floodgates with the dung question. Um, how do you get rid of the smell of dung? If dung removes the milk smell, what removes the dung smell? There is no dung smell. Dung Again. doesn't? No, I mean, it smells when you take the cloth out, but, but it, by the time you put it in the you know, harsh sun for eight hours, there's really nothing by the end. I mean, I've, I've had people complain a lot about the, the stale milk smell when they come to visit my studio because, you know, I have cloth that is still treated with that I'm working on, but I've never heard anyone complain about tongue. And it's funny because I've gotten so, um, you know, these smells, I, I don't really um, um, sense these smells anymore. I don't really get them until I have visitors and they say, oh, what's that smell? I'm like, what smell? So. Um, to my knowledge, there's no dung smell once it's when the cloth is, you know, done with the bleach. Uh, now someone's asking, they're saying that it seems like most of what you do is for hangings. Do you also make um, uh, things that people could wear? Um, sure. I, I mean, originally these textiles were, were, were functional and just because it takes such a long time for me to make them, um, you know, if someone were to commission a piece and still want to wear it, absolutely. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to ask that. This research that you've been doing now with um, my, my colleague, Alexandra Palmer, um, did it inspire you at all to remake some of these um, 18th century men's banyans? Or oh, not they're so beautiful, aren't they? Um, yeah, well, no, because I know how long it takes to <laughs> make them that I'm not sure I want to, you know, wear it. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, this, this scrolls fast. I just had one. Um, uh, someone says, thank you so much. Can you tell us something about finding the right kind of cotton for making chintz? Ah, uh, well, I have found that uh, um, hand spun and hand woven cotton behaves very differently from machine spun and machine woven cotton. Uh, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I, I find that they're very different results. So um, one might want to, um, you know, experiment with both and, 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 and choose which one you like. Um, I've tried different kinds of, um, well, there's only one kind of cotton. I haven't tried the indigenous Indian cotton yet because it's, it's not um, readily available in the fine um, counts that I use. So um, what I use is predominantly what's called American cotton here. Yeah, my understanding is that there are many attempts going on to uh, reinvigorate the, the indigenous species, but that it's still the, the, the spinning and, and the weaving maybe isn't uh, what you need for that, that base. 
Yes. Um, because the indigenous cotton has shorter fiber, it um, doesn't run in the, you know, the, the, the mills, the spinning mills that are established for cotton spinning and can only be um, hand spun. And then we don't have, um, I mean, people do spin. There is still a lot of cotton spinning in India, but it's mostly a heavy accounts and not the fine accounts. So that's where the challenge is. Uh, we have a question. They said that uh, you mentioned that you did a lot of research in museums and chintz collections. Did you come to the ROM collections? <laughs> well, uh, I'm afraid COVID um, played a bit of a spoil sport in there. I, I was supposed to, uh, I hope to visit ROM um, last year, but, but hopefully soon. Yeah, we, we had an international symposium planned for April and Renuka was going to be coming to Toronto for that uh, together with 11 other international speakers. Uh, we will see if that becomes a virtual program instead. Um, somebody asked, did you already have drawing skills, especially for the botanicals before you started? Um, so I actually want to do um, before I went to college, I, I wanted to um, pursue painting. And my grandfather said, oh, you cannot be a, you know, an artist. It's, it can only be a hobby. I mean, he must be turning in his grave today, but <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've always been interested in, um, you know, drawing and painting. So um, that, that part of it wasn't the harder thing, but the harder part of my work is, is to actually, um, the scientific part of it is, is what I struggle with more. Uh, so a follow-up uh, question to that was, um, do you uh, draw your own patterns or are you still um, basing it on historical examples? Um, at the moment, it's still predominantly based on historic uh, patterns because um, I'm still figuring out the process. And I feel that, you know, a great way to figure out the process is to actually uh, reproduce historic pa patterns because it's it's only then can I figure out the, the nuances of, of the process. Um, but having said that, I do sometimes, you know, change, change them around a little bit, but yes, they're predominantly based on historic patterns. Okay, I know it's probably uh, 3.30 in the morning for you, so we will just do two more questions. Uh, we don't oh, want to abuse your generosity. Um, uh, let's see. Were you able to do chemical analyses of old textiles? Um, I personally haven't. Um, I only have like two samples that someone very generously gifted me. Um, but a lot of museums, um, and I know even Ram did too before the exhibition, uh, a lot of museums do their own analysis. Um, and it would be great if those were um, available. And I, I mean, I do talk to conservators who have, um, who have tested to confirm, you know, what diet is or, but sometimes we, we don't really know what materials were used always. For example, you know, if you remember, Sarah, we tried to get out the wax resist um, tested to figure out what it could be. But, you know, there were so many different materials um, that were identified that it's impossible to know exactly what went into resist. So, yeah, on, on that note, I know there, um, there are two studies that are either coming out or just came out. Uh, analyzing um, some of the red dyes. Um, uh, yeah, if anyone's interested, you can email me and I'll let, uh, I can pass on that information. Um, oh, but that question does remind me of a, f a funny incident where yeah, I purchased some dye from Kalahasti, which is, you know, the center of hand painting. And and it was sold to me in a, in a name, uh, um, it was called Chavel Kodi, which is a Telugu name um, locally. It's a local name, which is in some literature said, She is this Chavel Kodi. And, and so I thought I was using She. And it was only that I happened to have it tested um, um, by somebody. And, and in fact, that's the only testing that I did to, to know that it's actually Rubia Cardifolia. It is not She. And so 
you know, there's this confusion with nomenclature then. So I thought that was very fascinating. That is, here, I'm going to throw in one of my own questions. That is still one of the big, big remaining uh, nuts to crack, isn't it? To revive the use of that Che that gave the amazing, mm -hmm. brilliant reds. Can you see yourself going down that path and trying it, or maybe you already have? Absolutely. I mean, I think my um, my dream come true would be to actually grow all my dyes, indigo um, and shea. Um, and I mean, that would be the best way to really understand, you know, what what is the um, soil conditions or climate conditions? How does it affect um, you know, the coloring compounds in these dyes would be, yes, I, I would love to crack that one someday. So it, it, it might be on your agenda? Yes, it is. Okay, we're going to take um, just one more here. Um, and it is a, someone thanks you for being up at this ungodly hour and asks about water use. Do you use tap water or rainwater? Um, and does it matter? Um, so I live, um, the part of Bangalore that I live does not have groundwater, nor do we get um, uh, the municipal water. So I rely on actually water tankers to replenish my, um, my, my stock. Um, and I don't know where they get the water from. So, <laughs> so the only way I can um, control any of that is to actually use you know, filtered water. So um, I think it makes a difference, but again, it depends on what that water content is because some water sources have more iron and, and um, that would be really bad for your process that some water may not have an iron, but it could have um, a lot of minerals, which is great for your um, process so when you know you'd have to try it out uh okay there's just uh one more question um and then um we will thank you generously uh somebody wants to know if they wanted to acquire something of yours what they should do if they should contact you or do you have a website um or I you have a commissions anymore sorry and if you are taking commissions anymore um I have a website, but but I'm I'm <laughs> I'm afraid to say that it's 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 not it hasn't been updated for years. So yes, if you're interested, please do email me, and you know we can have a conversation. All right, um, I think I've managed to take um, some of the the main questions. Um, so thank you again, Renuka, for uh, joining us for this program and staying up late. And once again, sharing generously all of your hard won knowledge. Uh, we cannot thank you enough. And we certainly hope that we will have you here uh, before the exhibition closes. So with that, I would like to thank our many viewers and visitors for tuning in today and hope that you will be able to visit our exhibition um, to uh, see Renaku's pieces, as well as our 18th century works that we have on display. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And we hope to see you again for our next Curator Conversation, which is on February 10th. And details of this and all upcoming ROM at home events can be found on our website and social media channels. So thank you again to Ranuka. Thank you again to our many viewers and we hope to see you again soon. Uh, stay safe and stay well. Thank you. <laughs>